Talk Therapy CBT, a conversation about educating, helping, and connecting individuals to the world of psychology. This podcast is supported and produced by Inner Balance Psychology Center. I'm your host, Dr. Dawn Raffa, and join with me is my co-host, Anthony Dana. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you doing today, Anthony? I'm doing very well. Three cups of coffee, so I am buzzed. I'm not <laughs> buzzed. I, I'm uh, on point. You're on point. Yeah, it's good to do these in the afternoon after we're caffeinated, I think, right? Absolutely. So far, you've been the leader of the quote. However, I was thinking of making an executive decision to start the quote today. Is that okay with you? you? This is one of my favorite quotes. I actually have a magnet of it on my uh, fridge. It is, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. It is by an American author, Neil Donald Walsh. I would like to know what you think of this quote and how you may interpret it. Well, first, I've always been fascinated with people who use their middle names. Maybe that's why I haven't made it as a writer yet, because I don't have a middle name to use. Maybe I should just make one up. But anyway, I digress. I like this quote because what we all know, but we all don't want to admit to, or, you know, it's like, oh, that sounds like hard work and rolling up your sleeves. And uh, I really don't feel like doing that. And But it's the truth. And we know it's... It's, um, it's necessary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And by the way... This is one of my biggest challenges as a psychologist is to convince people to be uncomfortable, you know, in the spirit of their values and living a purposeful life. And it's sometimes really hard to convince people to be uncomfortable and go beyond their comfort zone. Do you want to tell the audience what our topic is today? So today's topic is, and we're not doing professions. I did mention that in the last broadcast. Actually, I have a game about professions and we are going to go into professions um, later on. But what I do want to just mention to the audience real quick is just, again, to encourage you guys to reach out to us any way, shape, or form. We have the website. Just let us know what you want us to talk about. And if it's an old show that you had, because we see there were a lot of uh, downloads for birth order, which is great. Is there something that maybe you want us to follow up on? We could do another birth order and just we could do birth order part two and then we can address questions. So so anything that you guys have as far as, uh, you know, some input, hopefully positive input, because we just want to be better. So we just want uh, good suggestions and good questions. We'd really love to hear from you. Today's episode is starting therapy and what to expect. And this was actually a suggestion from a patient of mine who is uh, also a therapist. I had that suggestion. So that's why we decided to go with this one today. Absolutely. It's a really good one. So my first question for you, doctor, would be what kind of questions I ask or should somebody ask a therapist once they go in to see a therapist? So you're saying for the first time? For the first time, you you go in for your appointment. What kind of questions could you ask or should you ask? Well, assuming that the person was maybe looked up, like maybe their bio and they had a little bit of information about this person, I would definitely recommend asking the therapist their areas of specialty and what disorders they're treating to see if they do specialize in the area that you're you're seeking help with. And also asking what, I guess, not really like success rate that they've had, but what, what techniques, tools, theoretical orientation that they come from to help treat that disorder. And that's something that you can most of the time look up, but when they explain themselves or express themselves, you can see, I guess, how passionate they are or or they can elaborate uh, in great detail. Right. You don't want to necessarily quiz them. Like it's different when you're talking to a surgeon, like, oh, how many surgeries have you had, you know, successfully with this, Mm -hmm. this type of ailment or surgery, but kind of like, okay, well, you know, how many people have you treated roughly? And, you know, how has your success been? I always recommend evidence-based treatment. So I have mentioned that word a bunch of times. Cognitive behavioral therapy is an evidence-based treatment. It is not the only one, but going to someone that they're using tools and techniques of treatment that is actually effective and works. All right. And a follow-up question that relates to, to my first one. With this first session, it's more of a collection of intel for the uh, therapist or the psychologist to take in. Right. So the first session, what you would want to expect is um, it's an intake session. So it really isn't the start of therapy. And our job is to do a clinical interview. So we're going to ask a lot of questions. You can certainly ask us questions too uh, about our background or what to expect, but we're going to take a family history, a personal history, medical history, obviously demographic information. So it's really just a Q&A for the first one. And also, honestly, it's to see if we're a good fit for one another because we're supposed to be working collaboratively together. 
And after that first session, if you feel like it may not be a good fit, you might want to kind of look for somebody else. However, I want to encourage you to give it some time too with that person and not make a snap judgment based on on that first interview. You mentioned uh, family history. And I've always noticed this with psychology that a lot of times, you know, parents are always blamed for something, whether it's fair or not fair. And, and, you know, you see this in television and movies and so on. How common is it for patients to realize just how uh, or to fully understand the influence that their parents have on their lives? Well, like you said, it's depicted in movies. So people tend to have some kind of idea of, oh, yeah, like this is I learned this from mom and dad. Maybe it's an excuse, but it's very relative. Parents provide you know, information to us about relationships and they model relationships to us. Um, what I mentioned before about cognitive behavioral therapy is they teach us how to develop and form beliefs about ourselves, others in the world, whether it's explicit messages or implicit ones. Also, we learn about parenting, you know, parenting from our parents about how we parent our own kids. So uh, lots of times people, you know, are aware to some degree. Some people are oblivious depending on their history, but it is definitely something to dive into. I have a lot of people who say, I don't want to talk about my childhood. I want to talk about this problem, <laughs> which, you know, is fine to a degree. Cognitive behavioral therapy is very uh, present day oriented, but we do have to dip into the past to find out about family relationships and history. Yeah. Do they realize that that's, these, these things are off limits. Like it doesn't work like that. Yeah. And I guess a lot of it is just fear, you know, and avoidance about talking about something from your child. They don't see the connection. Although I have to tell you, I almost always bring it back to something in childhood, even if it's briefly, there's always some relevance to it. With all of your patients, what is an obstacle that you see many of them have? Because they all have different, obviously different issues. What's a common denominator that they, most of them share that you find is an obstacle in them dealing with their problems? Well, my best answer would be fear and avoidance, kind of circling back to my quote. Fear is a huge factor with a lot of people being resistant to change. It's very positively reinforcing, meaning we get to hide behind our fear. Also, it feeds the you know behavior of avoidance. And underneath anxiety is always fear. You know, we get a lot out of avoiding. So like I said before, part of my job is to convince people to face their fears. Their fears could be fear of spiders, fear of bridges. It could be fear of being vulnerable. Honestly, even just coming to therapy for people is very scary because they're sharing their problems with a stranger, quote unquote. So that can also be a fear in and of itself. It's some of it's mostly fear of the unknown or fear that they know very well, they didn't like it, you know, left a bad taste in their mouth and they don't want to go back to reliving that or, or thinking or talking about that. Maybe like that. Those some patients that say, I don't want to talk about my childhood. Oh, yeah, definitely. Fear of uh, opening up that Pandora's box with depression. People are very stuck in the past. With anxiety, they're very stuck in the future. So absolutely fear of the unknown. People have beliefs ta uh, tagged to that. Like, what if the what if I go crazy? What if I break down? What if I cry in front of my therapist? Again, part of the acceptance piece with um, any of that is learning to accept that you're going to have this distress. Learn to tolerate it. I'm going to tell you a story. I went to a therapist. I wanted you to tell me if I overreacted. So I went to a therapist. Uh, we're talking about 30 minutes to 45 minutes when I was talking about what my problems were. I noticed that the therapist was like touching her eye from time to time. And then I noticed that she was crying and she grabbed the tissue and then she started to just dab her eyes. And I looked at her and said, are you crying? I got a little bit upset. I said, I'm like, am I, am I that messed up that, you know, like you're, you're, you're crying, you're crying during my session. And I got up and walked out. Okay. Wait, wait. Was she new in the field? Was she I don't know. She was rather young. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I, I just was like. So you're asking whether you, were you walking out was an overreaction? Uh, yeah. I mean. Did you go back? No. No. You I wanted out. my 10 bucks back <laughs> and I <laughs> wanted. Back. And I'm like looking now. And then I, then I was doing that. I was looking on her wall. Like, where did you go? Where did you go to school actually? Again? Right, wait, wait, so maybe I should have done more intel and research. Maybe. Yeah. A, yeah. Well, look, um, I guess you could view it a few ways. One is she was over empathizing with you, but. How did you, you must have had some belief about this person once that happened, 
like I can guess as to maybe what's going through your mind, but oh, what uh, when like after the fact, like crazy. it became about her at the moment, or you didn't I, see I it didn't as empathizing. Know. I didn't care. I, I just thought that it was. Was it weakness? Again, was it, it a sign of weakness? Great, listen, I guess it might. You know, the story I was telling could tug at anybody's heartstrings. I sure. wasn't looking for yeah. you feel sorry for me. I'm just telling you what is going on in my head and what's going on in my life, and I'm trying to deal with it in a better way. Right. Maybe you perceived it as this person being weak. That's just not, <laughs> not being a therapist. You're, you're supposed to be helping You're supposed me. to be strong. And you're, you know, like, yeah. I'm allowed to cry, not you. you yeah. know, if I start pulling yeah. you in my chair, you know, that's something that... that well, I guess that's a sign. Maybe at least on the first session, that, that's a sign. I don't know. So if you're... So, okay, so if your therapist cries <laughs> during the first session, that's a red flag. And I don't want... We don't want to I don't talk want about it. red flags. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be like mean but, and but say don't ever. One, right. Well, I mean, all right, look, so I would suggest if, if you were to say, hey, this happened with my therapist, well, if you were to go back and say, well, be direct, talk to this person about your concerns and be honest and practice assertiveness. So but listen, the last time I came in, you were bawling. That's, <laughs> I, I, that made on the me cry. Feel, that made Was me it? feel weird. I felt like I had to help you. <laughs> right. Well, that's just it. Like you feel like maybe then, you know, you need to help this person rather than this person helping you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I just, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I just, that just came to my mind, Ralph. And I'm like, you know what? Let me just, uh, you can ask that. I yeah. wanted to get your, I wanted to get you. Maybe I just, I buried that a long time ago. I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, and maybe. Ask your, ask your opinion. Well, one of the other things I wanted to mention um, early, from earlier that is uh, what to look for in a therapist is someone who's working with you and collaborative in nature. I um, usually tell my supervisees and my staff, like, don't tell patients what to do, not directly. This is what you should and shouldn't do. And people come into me after they've maybe been to another therapist and they say that what their experience was, perhaps it was negative. And I'm like, well, like, don't tell patients what to do. That's just not our job. Our job is to help people figure out their own problems. And plus, I don't want that responsibility. I don't want to be, oh, Dr. Rafa told me to do this and then it didn't work. Then who's to blame? (laughs) So you're you're more of a guide. You're more. Yeah, more of a guide. And I tell people I work collaboratively with you. Again, the essence of CBT is collaborative in nature. We're going to work together. And one of the goals is to help people to feel empowered. I don't want them to be dependent on me. Yeah, certainly in the power dynamic of the relationship, I'm doctor, their patient. But I always want to help people to solve their problems and feel empowered. So throughout the years, what are some of your proudest moments as a therapist um, with feeling proud about your patients and seeing your patients realize what they their potential potential and what they would benefit from doing and them them discovering it on their own i'm sure you have a few that you maybe you'd like to share without mentioning too much information yeah absolutely well the first thing that comes to mind was kind of a cute story of when i was early on in my career there was a 7 year old that actually taught me how to play chess okay. and that was pretty amazing cuz chess is an amazing game and i've been able to teach my son, how to play chess. I was able to teach kids how to play. And it's really, really powerful as a therapeutic technique for kids that have ADHD or even just teaching kids the consequences of their behavior because they have to, you know, make a move. My move depends on their move. So you can use it really effectively as a a game in therapy without it being just talking about feelings all the time. So that definitely sticks out in my mind. And now you know how to play chess. And now I know how to play chess. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty rusty, I think, at this point. I haven't played in a while, especially with the pandemic. But yes, it's a a great game to play. The other one, I guess that would be, you're talking about like a success story. There's There's one young woman I've known since she was a teenager that had a pretty significant history and on paper had a lot of issues that she had to deal with, a lot of treatment here and there. And she is doing phenomenal now because of the work that we've done together and she's done even without me. I would say because she's so resilient, she doesn't realize that I have to remind her constantly. She really took to learning and using all the tools that we've talked about in her toolbox. And when I see that happening, people making changes in their life, whether it's thinking differently or behaving differently, it's always really great for me and also for them because then I was able to teach them about themselves. All right. My last question. Throughout the years that you've uh, influenced and, and collaborated with your patients and, and problem solving, have any of your patients from time to time taught you anything? Besides chess. Besides, <laughs> besides the, the seven-year-old. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, yes, definitely patience with people. Lots of times I forget about the value of the therapeutic relationship. Studies still show that 50% of the success that, that patients have is because of the therapeutic relationship. It's a big part, you know, no matter what theoretical orientation they use. So trust and also hope, you know, hope with humanity and people's resiliency. I would say that those are the best lessons. There are people I really thought that would not make some changes in their life and really get through tough stuff and they prove otherwise. Well, great. Are you uh, ready to play a game? Absolutely. Game time it is. I put together a list from 2018. I believe it's the acronym is, I wrote it down here somewhere, APA, and which you are a member. Right. American Psychological Association. Okay, yeah. Good. Yeah. Just so everybody knows what that means. It is the top 10 most stressful professions in okay. 2018. All right. And I want to see if you can, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do this. Yes. We'll see if you can get them all. You get three strikes and you're out. Right. Do I you keep <laughs> going, you know, you keep getting them, you keep getting them. Do I get a lifeline? No. Like, well, we, we see if now if we, if we, you know, if we had Cameron here, maybe, and then we can have, we can have live calls and then, you know. I know. Um, if we had the whole. That would be fun. We could do that one time. Yeah. Maybe. Once, once we grow once we to grow, a studio and we're videoed. Yeah. Maybe we could, we could do that. We'll have listeners galore. Oh yeah. So, okay. So what would be uh, your first. Uh, My first guess as in like, it is the most stressful. Are we going like. No, well, yeah, but I mean, it's top 10. So even top 10. Number 10 is pretty darn stressful. (laughs) There's nine other professions that are are, are considered more stressful based on this study. All right. So dentist. All right. I'm looking through here. That used to be on the list because people hate them. (laughs) All right. um, He, I guess a dentist would be considered Mm -hmm. a healthcare worker. No. No? Mm-mm. Okay, so I just gave you white one. Oh, you gave me one. Jeez. I don't see anything that's so, like. Nothing dental no, related. No, and I said, so, okay, so healthcare worker. So since I just already gave up one. I mean, yes, it's a healthcare worker. That's super broad. It very, it is, right? I mean, I'm a healthcare worker. Right, every, yeah, exactly. Well, okay. Next time I'll find a more detailed study. That's fine. But that's, okay. But some of the professions are very precise. Okay. So, as long so, as there's okay, a so healthcare mix. workers. Right. There are various different various types. types. Yeah. Uh, that's number three. And dentist apparently isn't on this list in 2018. I don't know. But why were, so you said they were on the list. Well, the highest suicide rate. Okay. Why is that? Well, from what I gather and understand, it's because people hate them. People hate going to them. They're miserable. Do they know it's not personal though? I don't know. <laughs> Listen, this was whenever, I don't know when it was, but it was definitely something that was, I read or someone told me like some time ago, but. Did I ever tell you um, the worst, uh, I had a really bad interaction with the dentist. When oh, I, was, I uh, just, a really bad? When I was, when I was young, yeah. I, uh, the dentist, um, I was crying. And I think I was maybe like six or seven and he mm-hmm. smacked me in the face. Oh, God. And guess what happened? You I smacked st- him back. I stopped crying. <laughs> <laughs> that really? Oh. Yeah, I'm not trying to, you know, that not, you know, but yeah, it worked. All right. Um, so that, well, look, there's... There's not so that, that guy, many pleasant. I could see, you know, he, he, <laughs> he, he wasn't a good guy. I, right. Well, people, they have, a lot of kids have phobias of dentists. You have to do a lot of exposure sure. response prevention. That's why they get knocked out because they're so afraid. Not, not a lot though, do they? Yeah. They have anesthesia for pediatric dentistry. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Next let guess. me, all right. Stock broker, financial. Number eight, corporate executive. That would qualify. Okay, let's go with that. Corporate exec, yeah. You know, CEOs are stressed out. Yes. Veterinarian? No. 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 Only when you have to put the dog down. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, I had a um, a veterinarian that I know told me that there's a high suicide rate in her field. Okay, well, then the study is... <laughs> I don't know what this is. Okay. What's going on with APA? I'm going to revoke my membership. All right. All right, so let me keep guessing. Yeah, that's two strikes, technically, but whatever. Who cares? All right, how about a principal? Okay, teachers... Teachers, principals, and so, so, yeah. Okay. Well, especially First of all, year. how dare you that you would think a principal <laughs> would be more stressed out than a teacher? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, because we actually do stuff. Um, of course you do. All right. <laughs> so, all no, right, so we don't sit in our ivory tower. Okay. So there is number two, but the, the list says teacher. So it didn't say mm-hmm. education because that can be mm-hmm. could be principal, could be you know superintendent, but they said just teacher. So okay. it's unfortunate that they're you know, mm-hmm. descriptive with certain professions, but than healthcare worker. Right. Now I'm inclined to say uh, like a medical doctor, like a surgeon, but I don't know if that would be encompassed under healthcare worker if 
I wouldn't say so. I mean, I, 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 I mean, the, you might kill them on the table. Yeah. According to Grey's Anatomy, they were stressed out people. All right. Give me another shot because we got, so we got seven and eight and yeah. three. That's so it. There's, yeah, so healthcare mm-hmm. worker was three. Uh-huh. Teacher is seven and uh-huh. corporate executive is eight. Okay. Trash man or woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, no, I guess that'd be, that'd be a stressful job. I, I wouldn't want to do it. No, that's not on here. So. <laughs> all, all right. So let me just count them down. For all you. right. All okay, right. So let's bail go. me okay. out. Number 10, taxi driver. Oh, okay. Okay. And I guess that, that would, would that to be Uber? These, I guess more Uber would qualify too or no? Just taxi. I don't know. Is a taxi more stressful than an Uber? I guess so. Because Uber is a different thing. I mean, I, I guess we'll have is. to start finding out. Yeah. That. All right. Number nine. You'll love this one. Yeah. An event coordinator. Get out of here. They are very stressed. Well, I can see a wedding planner being stressed because bridezillas exist. So event and they have to like coordinate an event without a hitch. Right. Yeah. Mm. Most stressful. A lot of pressure. Yeah. A lot of pressure. And uh, nobody's lives are in danger though. I mean, but okay. <laughs> number six, social worker. Right. Number five, this one I have a major issue with. News reporter. They have a stressful. Now, listen, if I'm on location in a third world country that's at war, okay, yeah. those those individuals. Well, they can be I a prisoner it. of war. They're a journalist. Yeah. 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 But, if but I, not just sitting behind the desk. Is what oh, yeah, I mean, if I. If I <sighs> reading the news. Stop. I mean, again, I know they're going to get a deadline maybe and so on. And you're, you're, you're. Well, I guess if you have to give bad news, I wonder if the. Stress rate has increased in the last year for news reporters because of COVID. But, well, in Anchorman, he wasn't stressed. So, (laughs) all right, we'll go with that. Okay. Number four. Mm -hmm. This one. Yeah. Pilot. Oh, gosh. I forgot about that. And and with that, I mean, you throw in air traffic controller. I mean, anybody who's involved, I would would think I would would go with. So, yeah, definitely number four is warranted, I believe. Number three, we touched on. And yes, and. Again, a lot of different professions. I, I would say there's a tier even with, with healthcare workers because there's different kind of healthcare workers. Number two, first responders. Totally get it. Yeah. yeah first and responders. With first responders, yeah. we have what? We have police, we have policemen, firemen, EMTs, right? That's all. Okay. Yep. And yep, yes, yep. number two, definitely. Number one, <laughs> enlisted military personnel. I was personnel. going to say that. How dare you? How dare I forget? These <sighs> are all the people with PTSD. Exactly. Like no matter what rank. To so all of our veterans you know, out there, we apologize and thank you for your service. Yeah, we appreciate it. It's um definitely top of the list, more yeah. so than a psychiatrist, I guess. Hmm. All right. So there's our there's our top ten list and there's our game. And I will come up with something. I like to come up with a game every week and I will continue to do so. Right. And again, as we've mentioned before, we are still in our infancy with launching our podcast um as of about a week. I believe I am so much better than I was during this. Everybody listened to me during the first podcast <laughs> and the growth listen, and listen to me now. Yeah. And I'm only going to get better. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be good. Oh, thanks a lot. Keeps getting better. Yeah. Um, right. So like we said, please feel free. I hope, I hope so. <laughs> Jesus Remember Christ. Remember I said I want to have hope with my baby. <laughs> <laughs> want to have hope with my patients. Yeah. With my co-host, I'd like that as well. So as we've said, there are ways to get in touch with us. You can catch all of our episodes and more at www.innerbalancepsychology.com or uh, talktherapycbt.com. You can email us at info at And as always, thanks for listening to our show. We will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Also wanted to mention that we have launched our podcast episodes and they can be found on lots of directories. They're on Amazon, on Apple, Deezer, Spotify, on Spotify. Again, on our website, you can find the feed for that as well. So remember everyone, stop it and give yourself a chance. (laughs) 